Everybody knows what a bully is. Mm -hmm. Everybody's seen a bully operate. Now, when does a bully stop being an asshole? When you break their nose. When you bust them in the nose. What have you made of the way that some people have responded to Putin's invasion of Ukraine on your own team? So before I joined the White House, um, I was teaching for the Marine Corps, and at the same time I was moonlighting as national security editor for Breitbart. I didn't need the job, okay? Bannon saw me speak somewhere, invited me for a chat, said, will you be my national security QC guy? And I said, I'm not really interested, and I threw out a stupid number, and he said yes. And that's when you go, oh crap, okay. <laughs> so the reason I was in principle interested in doing that, what, 10 years ago, was because of the paucity I saw on the right of serious discussion on national security. Because back then you had two options. If you, if you are a conservative in America, you could be a, a, a crazy neocon saying, let's invade places and turn them into democracies at the end of a gun barrel, which is lunacy, right? The Wolf of of the world, the Bush administration. Or you could be an isolationist and say, screw everybody, we don't care. Uh, anything beyond the Pacific and the Atlantic is irrelevant and they can all go to hell. And I thought, you know, you can be a little bit more nuanced than that. There is a palette of options. And the idea that you can isolate yourself from the rest of the world after 9-11 or in the cyber age is just as stupid as thinking you can turn Afghanistan into Switzerland. So that's why I did it. Today, 10 years later, it is by magnitudes worse on our side. It is, this is perhaps beyond everything the left is doing to this country in my estimation. Open borders, millions of illegal immigrants, fentanyl poisonings, on and on and on the economy. For me, the thing that galls me the most every single day and I have people on my Twitter feed, you know, get in touch with the radio show, who call themselves conservatives or Republicans, and who say things like, Vladimir Putin is the savior of Western civilization <laughs> and a great Christian. And I'm going, you do know, you don't have to be a Cold War child like me, but you do know this is a KGB officer who persecuted Christians for a living, and is a thug and a murderer. And people are saying, oh, well, he's justified in invading Ukraine because, because we provoked him. What? What are you talking about? A nation like Ukraine, which is ranked 22nd in the world in military power, is threatening a nation ranked second that has more than 4,000 nuclear warheads. And you're telling me we provoked it or Ukraine provoked it. So I am horrified. We had this discussion over cigars last night. I still don't understand how anyone who has at least a triple digit IQ can say the Russian Federation and Putin are the good guys. Mm. So we have, to answer your question in brief, we have a lot of bloody work to do to educate people on my team about the reality of geopolitics today. And you don't have to be a, a geek about it like me, just the fact. Well, let's do that then, because yeah. the, the interesting thing uh, is that I think, as you say, not a lot of people are educated on either way. What is the national security interest for this country in supporting Ukraine? So you can answer that at a very prosaic level that is intuitive, and then you can go to the geopolitical level. The prosaic one, look, everybody's gone to school, okay? Or everybody's been a member of a club or the Boy Scouts or the football team or what have you. Everybody knows what a bully is. Mm -hmm. Everybody's seen a bully operate. Now, when does a bully stop being an asshole? When you break their nose. When you bust them in the nose. If you don't stand up, if somebody doesn't stand up to a bully on the playground or in Eastern Europe, the bully proceeds to continue to bully the vulnerable. The idea that whatever reason or excuse is provided, a nuclear-tipped nation with 11 time zones can break a taboo that has been in place since 1945 in Europe, which means you must not aggrandize your territory through use of force, is dangerous to every decent nation, every decent person. And if you want to go to the wonkish level, do your homework about Vladimir Putin or any aspect. The bio, I love the biolab stuff. Oh, really? The biolabs was the reason? Who's thinking built the biolabs? The Soviet 
union built the bio labs. It wasn't Condoleezza Rice and George Bush that built the you know bio labs. So get a little bit of your factual uh, ducks in order, but specifically a little bit of homework. Who is Vladimir Putin beyond a KGB officer, a Siloviki, a member of the Nomenklatura's national security enterprise? He's a man who, since becoming president for 21 years, has been giving speeches about the illegitimacy of Ukraine as an independent nation, the illegitimacy of the Baltic states, the illegitimacy of Poland as an independent nation that all should be subsumed into the Rodina, into Mother Russia. And you think, well, those are the states that border Russia. Those are the states who are fully paid up members of NATO. So you think this won't have consequences? That a man who has already proven that he will keep his promises to use force, to take territory, wants to take Poland, the Baltic states, he must be sent a message. You are not permitted to do that. And if you just want to be very pedestrian about it, he's a bully who has to be given a bloodied nose. And Seb, what would you say to those people who provide a more nuanced argument and go, look, we have been an antagonistic presence in that area of the world. And Ukraine is a buffer zone or a buffer nation, and it's rapidly becoming more westernized. He sees this as a threat to Russia, and he sees himself encroached on practically all sides by pro-Western nations. Right. Encroached by what? What is the quality of that? If we want to use the language of moral equivalency mm. and, the, and the, the terminology of the Kremlin propagandists, what is the encroachment? It's the encroachment of Western values of representative government. That's the problem for Putin. The Putin, it isn't we're an empire invading Ukraine, invading the Baltics, invading the NATO. I, I worked, my job was to get Hungary into NATO when I worked for the Hungarian Defense Ministry. We were desperate to get back in. Why? Did we want to be a satrapy, uh, a slave state of a, you know, a, a Western empire? No, we wanted to be part of what? A member of a, a, a group of nations that is part of the West, that has representative government, that has free markets. So, so again, let's translate it into prosaic terms. What is NATO? What is the EU? They're clubs. Nobody's forced to join the EU or NATO. Nobody puts a gun to the prime minister's head you know, of, of Sweden and says, you must join. No, you have to want to join mm -hmm. and you have to hit certain membership requirements. In NATO's case, it's very, very easy. You read the 14 points of the Washington Treaty, it just says you must have a representative democratic government and you must uh, contribute to the collective defense of the club. Okay, well, if Poland wants to join, if Hungary wants to join, if Ukraine wants to join, why does another nation that's outside of the club get to have a veto? I mean, imagine if what, 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 you're into movies, right? Like me. You join the BFI, the British Film Institute. I was a member when I lived in England. What if your neighbor said, you know, he's a bookworm and he thinks he's a Luddite and he thinks that movies are evil. Would you be okay with your neighbor saying you have no right to join the BFI voluntarily? You say, are you on drugs? Excuse me? No, I have a right to join any association that I can meet the requirements of. So this whole idea that we're an empire, how did we gobble up these nations? They applied, to, it was tough for Hungary. We, we had to bump up our defense spending. We had to say, yeah, these are the things we will contribute within a year to NATO. We will have a training center. These, these are things that are voluntary. But another nation that's outside gets to stop you. That's just nuts. So the, the obvious can you know, I agree with you yeah. on a lot yeah. of this stuff, obviously, but the obvious counter argument to this is if Mexico wanted to join the Warsaw Pact, would America just let that happen? Uh, that's a Cold War context, yeah. right? So America would do its darndest to stop that, but there would be no moral or other justification for us to invade Mexico to stop that. Yeah. We, we would cease to be America. If we said M Mexico has decided, if there's a referendum, if it's not some kind of dictatorship, if Mexico decided, the, the idea that, what, we're going to invade you to stop you doing something you voluntarily want to do. We might use force if what happened in 
Afghanistan happened in Mexico. What happened in Afghanistan in the Christmas of 79? The Spetsnaz were deployed, went in and assassinated the prime minister. And then the tanks rolled in and said, oh, Afghanistan is now part of the, you know, the broader association. The fraternal of, peoples oh, yeah, of Afghanistan. Oh, friendly, yeah, friendly nations, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, it's, again, it, what is missing with these arguments is the moral content. It's the, it's the, it's, it's the um, obvious fallacy of the Chomskyite, Michael Moore moral equivalency that, you know, the West is just another version of the East or NATO is just another version of the Warsaw Pact. No, it's not. When, when you joined the Warsaw Pact, you were told to join the Warsaw Pact. I'll give you one interesting example. What was one of the biggest problems with NATO? It's a wonky phrase called interoperability. We're all free nations. And everybody had their own vested interests and proclivities. I'm a gun guy. We had, at the height of NATO, a dozen different kinds of assault rifle for troops, right? Brits had the FN, uh, America had the uh, M16, uh, on, uh, the, the, the Belgians had, you know, FNC. Why? Because we chose them. In the Warsaw Pact, how many types of gun did you have? One. Good old AK. Good old AK. And then, how many types of uniform? Think about this. In, in, across NATO, everybody had, it was a nightmare. We had DPM camo in, in, in England. Uh, the, the, the French had their kind of uniforms across the whole of the Warsaw Pact. You had the massive hats, the big epaulettes. Why? Because you didn't choose how to defend yourself. You were told by the Frunze Academy, you were told by the general staff in Moscow, you will have the T-72, you will have these uniforms, and you will have an AK. There's no moral equivalence, there's no qualitative equivalence to East and West, despite what Chomsky and others would have you believe. And Seb, what do you say to those people who go, look, we're funneling billions yeah, to Ukraine. Right. You look at what's happening in our inner cities. Yeah. Look what's happening with you know the, the fentanyl crisis. Yeah. Look what's happening with the unemployment. Look at the debt. How can we possibly justify this? Yeah, this is like the, the, the Tucker Carlson wing of, of the party here. And it's, it, it, it's intuitive. It, it's, it's a seductive argument. I mean, think about just, I, I did the figures for my TV show recently. If you add up all the combat deaths by, suffered by the United States since the end of World War II, so that's Korea, that's Vietnam, that's post 9-11 Afghanistan, that's Gulf 1 and Gulf 2. If you add all of the war fighters killed in combat for over 70 years, it's, seven, it's 103,000 combat deaths. Last year, according to Biden's CDC, the Center for Disease Control in America, according to this regime's CDC, 110 thousand Americans were killed by overdoses, mostly from fentanyl. So you go, what? More people, more civilians died in 12 months mm. in America because of open borders than died in 70 years of combat in Southeast Asia, in Afghanistan. So it's, it's kind of like, whoa. But that's not how politics works. These aren't mute, you, you can't, as we say in America, you've got to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Just because we have a border crisis doesn't mean that Ukraine is irrelevant mm -hmm. and doesn't mean that if we don't do something about it now, it won't get worse. What, what are we going to do if he invades the Baltic states? I mean, we have an Article 5, Britain, the US, has an Article 5 commitment to the Baltic states, to Hungary, to Poland. If they are invaded, by another nation, they are obliged, we are obliged to respond, which during the Cold War meant what? Nuclear war. Mm. Is, are we prepared to do that? Or, or should we do something about it now to make sure it doesn't get to that point? From the beginning of this conflict, 14 months ago, I, I wrote a piece, I think it was for Breitbart or my Substack, where I said, we must stop this, but not by boots on the ground. I don't want the 82nd Airborne to be deployed to Kiev. And it's Kiev, by the way, guys. <laughs> okay, you know, Kiev. We don't say Paris. Okay. Um, I've said from the beginning, we must help them help themselves. Mm -hmm. And the the argument I used to kind of take the, the the legs from under conservatives who say screw Ukraine is, oh, okay. Is 1776 important to you? The Revolutionary War that created America. Oh, it is. You you believe that America should have split from King George and. Uh -huh. What would have happened if Spain, France, and Holland hadn't supported Washington, George Washington? 
<laughs> where we are sitting now would be part of the British Commonwealth. Hmm. Right? Damn those French. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, so, no, you're so, right. So, so, the idea, so just to translate it, I don't want to fight for Ukrainians because we're not an empire. But to help them fight for themselves is what we should be doing. But to your first point, shoveling plane loads of cash to an immensely corrupt regime. Let's look. Uh, I think Zelensky. It's Eastern is Europe, a, of course. It's, it's corrupt. It's dumb. So at the beginning, I wrote an article. Three things we need to do. Number one, we need to supply them with the means they need to protect themselves. Mostly ammunition. They need artillery pieces. Number two, equipment which they can actually use. This asinine thing that we're sending them, Abraham's tanks. Abraham tanks have more than a dozen different types of fluid to run them. A T-72 has oil and diesel, right? Ukrainians don't know how to use, haven't had the training for F-16s or whatever else. We have stockpiles of Warsaw era, Warsaw Pact era stuff in Hungary, in Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia. Give them equipment they can use, number two. And the third one, is provide, we are peerless. America's ISR, so our intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance capabilities, our satellites, nobody comes close to us. Give them the real-time target data packs so they can make the Russians bleed in Ukraine. That's what we do, but not pallets of cash, not you know, billions of dollars in the space of one year. That's, where I, that's my nuanced approach between the isolationists and the send the 82nd Airborne.